To start with the surface landmarks, it's really important that you're able to physically identify and palpate the surface landmarks I have drawn here. You see right over this um, circle right here is Lister's tubercle, which is a dorsal prominence over the distal radius. I've outlined the contour of the distal radius and also the distal ulna, as well as the extensor called the ulnaris tendon. And looking more distally, you have the, the scaphoid, the lunate, and the triquetrum. If you take your finger and you go just distal to Lister's tubercle, you can feel a little soft spot. That's oftentimes when we do wrist arthroscopy, it's a three, four portal, so it's between the third and fourth compartment. It's also where you have the scaphoid um, joint or scaphoid ligament. And turning Carol's hand this direction, this is the first dorsal compartment. You could palpate fairly easily. And that's your abductor pollicis longus and also your extensive pollicis brevis tendon as it goes distally towards the thumb CMC joint. It's also important to be able to outline the base of the thumb metacarpal. And then turning the hand more volarly, you have a prominence volarly here, which is a scaphoid tubercle. So before you start any type of physical examination, it's really important to identify the bony landmarks, really orient yourself to respect to the anatomy of the wrist in terms of where the focal swelling is, where you may have any gross deformity of the hand or wrist. Okay, we're gonna start with some examination maneuvers, starting with patients who present with radial side of wrist pain, and as well as potentially pain at the base of the thumb. So it's important to identify the thumb carpal metacarpal joint here. So a couple of common exam maneuvers is looking for tenderness over the thumb metacarpal base. As your range of the thumb CMC joint, you're looking for any crepitus on range of motion, and sometimes you actually feel the thumb metacarpal sublux as you flex and extend the thumb CMC joint. So this is the CMC joint. It's important to really differentiate between that and more, dors more proximally and volarly. This is the STT joint. So my thumb is on the scaphoid tubercle. So patients come in with STT arthritis, which is much more proximal. The pain is more volar and also more proximal. And lastly, as we're looking at this region right here, this is the first dorsal compartment. So patients come in with Decker veins tenosynovitis. Instead of pain over the CMC joint, it's gonna be more proximal. So palpation directly over the first dorsal compartment. Also a exam maneuver that we like to do is called Finkelstein's. So have the patient flex their thumb and bring their fingers over the thumb and you're basically placing the wrist into ulnar deviation. What you're doing is putting stress on the first dorsal compartment and this will reproduce pain and typically patients will guard quite a bit. So that's the Finkelstein test. And in the same region, again, you really want to differentiate between different sources of radial sided wrist pain. The anatomic snuff box is between the first and second compartment. So it's a soft spot here as you're going just dorsal to the first compartment. So any tenderness over the anatomic snuff box raises suspicion of a scaphoid fracture. And I'm going to move from radial to dorsal. As we move more dorsally, this is your second compartment drawn out, your ECRL, ECRB tendon. As you look more proximally, patients with dorsal wrist pain and other conditions, and otherwise known as intersection syndrome, it's between the second and first dorsal compartment where they intersect. So it's typically about five centimeters proximal to the wrist joint. It's where the second compartment, this first compartment are intersecting, and patients will have tenderness to palpation directly over this region, also on flexion extension of the wrist, um, you oftentimes feel crepitus. People talk about a wet leather sensation or a sound, so you'll feel the two tendons gliding on top of each other and with that really that wet leather sensation as you're doing that. So as we're looking more ulnarly, it's important to identify right over the stairs tubercle, your EPL tendon or your extensor pollicis longus tendon is gonna be coming this way, right around the ulnar aspect of Lister's and going towards the thumb. So this is important on a patient who comes in with a non-displaced distal radius fracture who may have EPL tendon that's under quite a bit of pressure and uh, compression. So they may have tenderness directly over the EPL tendon. I'm gonna ask Carol to extend her thumb. So as you extend her thumb, you can see the EPL tendon really well. So you wanna make sure patients do have an intact EPL tendon. If they have tenderness directly over that region, especially with a distal radius fracture, you do want to be careful that there might be a pending ESPL rupture. Um, 
especially on a patient that's a few weeks out from the injury. As we go more ownerly, again, we're gonna start superficially. Um, just owner to the owner head, you have the ECU tendon. This is your extensor called nearest tendon, which is right over here. So you may have tenderness over the ECU tendon. And what I like to do for these patients is also look for any subluxation of the ECU tendon. So I'm gonna have Carol bring her wrist up and make a fist. And as you go from pronation to supination, you'll find that with the ECU tendon sheet that's unstable, the tendon will sublux ownerly and volarly as you go from pronation to supination. This is the ECU subluxation test. And then lastly, um, the ECU synergy test, have the patient um, open up their hand and radially abduct their thumb and you have the resist thumb radio abduction. What's happening here as the patient does this is they're firing their FCU and their ECU tendon. So by doing this exam maneuver and they have reproducible dorsal ulnar wrist pain, it's indicative of ECU pathology or ECU tenosynovitis or tendonitis. So that's your superficial anatomy. We're gonna dive deeper now into the carpal bones. So as we're looking deeper, we talked about the anatomic stuff box. And this is the scaphoid and lunate. So this is the scaphoid lunate joint. So somebody coming in with a high energy trauma, you're suspicious of a scaphoid lunate joint injury. You're looking for any tenderness over the scaphoid lunate joint. Looking more ownerly, this is your lunate triquetrum. So a dorsal triquetral fracture. The tenderness is directly over the triquetrum. We're also looking for any gross instability as we palpate the scaphoid and lunate. You want to kind of shift back and forth. Similarly, there's a test known as the lunotriquetral ballotment test or the Reagan test. You put a thumb on the lunate and then on the triquetrum, you're basically blotting back and forth, looking for any gross instability and crepitus as you blot the lunotriquetral joint back and forth. And now I'm actually gonna take the wrist and rotate it slightly. And we talked about the scaphoid tubercle, which is right over that, that's that volar prominence over the um, wrist flexion crease. So a Watson shift test is a provocative test looking for scaphoid lunate instability. You're basically putting your thumb directly on the scaphoid tubercle. And so I'm gonna rotate back here. So one thumb is on the scaphoid tubercle. My index finger is over the anatomic stuff box. And as I go from flexion, owner deviation to radial deviation, so as you've seen on the talk on carpal kinematics and carpal anatomy from Dr. Allen, as you go from ulnar deviation to radial deviation, the scaphoid wants to flex. So if you have an intact scaphoid lunate ligament, um, it keeps the scaphoid in check, but if you have disruption, as you go from ulnar to radial deviation, the scaphoid wants to flex. If you have a disruptive scaphoid lunate ligament dorsally, the scaphoid will kick out approximately, so you actually feel a clunk with your index finger where the proximal pole of the scaphoid is kicking out dorsally. So that's the Watson shift test. That's not to be confused with a mid-carpal clunk um, as described by Dr. Allen as well. A mid-carpal clunk is really where you have the entire distal proximal row that falls into flexion. So as opposed to putting your thumb on the scaphoid tubercle, you're basically gonna start the wrist in radial deviation. As you axially load, so you're putting axial pressure on the carpus, as you go from radial to ulnar deviation, a patient who has a mid-carpal clunk, as you go into terminal wrist ulnar deviation, you'll feel a catch-up clunk. As it goes from here to here, you'll feel a clunk as that distal row, as that proximal is now going to extension and the distal row follows. So you're really correcting that volar sag going from radial to ulnar deviation. That's a mid-carpal clunk. So it's important to recognize that a lot of patients have a physiologic laxity. So as you're doing this, you'll feel clicking, uh, especially on a hypermobile female. This is actually an um, exam finding that could be, could be normal or physiologic. So that's a big carpal clunk. So I'm gonna continue on the ulnar aspect of the wrist. I'm gonna actually rotate a little bit here. As we're looking at different sources of ulnar side of wrist pain, we talked about the ECU with a synergy test and also subluxation. The ulnar fovea, you can feel the FCU or the flexor carpal ulnar is tending here. So just deep to this is otherwise known as the ulnar soft spot. So this is the ulnar fovea. You take the FCU tendon just deep to that, you're looking for deep palpation of the ulnar fovea. Any tenderness in that region is indicative of potentially TFCC pathology. 
So you really want to deep, um, palpate deep to the FCU tendon. And we talked about the lunotriquetral bolamin test, but the shear test is very similar. What you're actually doing is putting your thumb on the pisiform, and putting the other hand on the lunate. You're trying to shear. So pisiform is now putting pressure on the triquetrum. You're shearing that dorsally, looking for instability of the lunotriquetral joint. And lastly, looking at LT ligament um, dysfunction. You're looking at lunotriquetral compression, so putting your thumb on the ulnar aspect of the triquetrum and just compressing. You're basically pushing the triquetrum into the lunate and looking for increased pain or grinding or crepitus, and that's the LT compression test. As we're looking at distal radial ulnar joint instability, so you'll hear different tests being described. One is the piano key sign. So the piano key sign is with the dorsal ulnar it sublux dorsally, so you'll see a very prominent ulnar head. So piano key is if you have a dorsally sublux distal ulna or ulnar head, you're basically reducing it. So it feels like a piano key as you're pushing down on the ulnar head and reducing, that's the piano key sign, as opposed to DRAJ Balaman where you're going back and forth between the radius and ulna, looking for laxity. It's important to do this test both in pronation and also in supination. You want to look for a position of instability. Are they stable in pronation and unstable in supination? Are they unstable in pronation and stable in supination? It's really important to differentiate between where the um, instability is. What I actually like to do, especially intraoperatively on a distal radius fracture, if you do a Balaman test, oftentimes you check it, it feels kind of loose, but instead what I like to do is take a patient from supination, as if I forcefully pronate them, I'm looking for subluxation, of the DREJ, so as you go from supination, where they're typically stable, to pronation, you're looking for basically the dorsal subluxation of the ulnar head by doing that, so that's a DREJ instability test. And lastly, a source of ulnar side wrist pain that's oftentimes misdiagnosed or missed is piezo arthritis. So you can feel the pisiform, which is a building prominence over the volar ulnar aspect of the wrist. You're looking for any pain on compression, and sometimes you'll feel crepitus by doing that. You're also looking for increased mobility of the pisiform as you translate it on the, on the triquetrum. So this is, again, for piezo triquetral arthritis. This is oftentimes your women in their 40s and 50s who come with the side of wrist pain, and you're looking for hyperlaxity and also crepitus over the piezo triquetral joint.